I'm going to be speaking on Navigating Genesis. It's the title of a book I wrote a few years ago, and uh, you can get a free chapter of the book at reasons.org uh, slash Ross. Now, I got a question for all of you. How many have ever run across someone who says, I can't believe the Bible, Genesis teaches scientific nonsense? You ever gotten that? Okay, a few of you have. Well, I'm a counterexample. I was born, raised, and educated in Canada. I didn't really get to know a Christian until I showed up at Caltech for postdoctoral research. Um, but I was given a Gideon Bible in the public school. And I first opened that Gideon Bible. Uh, what brought me to faith in Christ was seeing how accurately the book of Genesis not only describes science and history, but actually predicts future science and history. So what I'm going to share with you tonight is part of my testimony of how looking at those early chapters of Genesis that for many people has been a problem for their faith, for me, it brought me to faith in Jesus Christ. So that's what I'm going to speak about this evening, uh, navigating Genesis, a scientific perspective on Genesis 1. And the core of the Christian faith is that God has given us two books, the book of Scripture and the book of nature. So a little bit of what I'm going to do this evening is show you how the book of nature corroborates the book of Scripture. And that's really the mission of Reasons to Believe. Uh, we engage people with the book of Scripture and use the book of Scripture as a tool to bring people uh, to, uh, use the book of nature to bring people to the book of Scripture and into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I have found, no matter where I speak in the world, they may have never heard of John 3.16, but almost everybody knows about Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I mean, I've run into people who've never heard of Jesus. They've never heard of the Bible, but they know this passage. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now we have space-time theorems that prove what this verse has to say. The heavens and the earth, you know, there is no Hebrew word for universe. If you read through the entire Old Testament, you'll never see the word universe. It doesn't exist in the Hebrew language. Uh, but they use this phrase, the heavens and the earth, Shemayan arrests with a definite article. You'll see that 13 times in the Old Testament, it always refers to the totality of physical reality. All matter, all energy, all space and time. Now, the New Testament does have a word for universe, the word cosmos. And what you see in Hebrews 11.3, the universe we detect did not come from that which we can detect. And we can detect matter, energy, space, and time. And unique to the Bible are explicit statements in, in the Bible that tell us that there's a beginning to time and that God was active before time even existed. 2 Timothy 1.9, the grace of God that we now experience was put into effect before the beginning of time. Or Titus 1-2, the hope we share in Jesus Christ was given to us before the beginning of time. Now, I was studying the Bible for the first time when I was in my late teenage years. And that was the same time when physicists in Britain and South Africa were developing the first of the space-time theorems. And... Uh, those theorems basically establish if the universe contains mass, and each one of you is living proof that the universe indeed does contain mass, and if general relativity reliably describes the movements of stars and galaxies in the universe, which we can now prove to 15 places of the decimal, then space and time have a beginning. Space and time are created which implies there must be an agent beyond space and time that brought our universe into existence. So the fact that you're here in the 21st century means we have rigorous scientific proof that the first verse of the Bible is correct. And this is significant because when you look at the other holy books or religions of the world, none of them speak about time being created or time at a beginning. That's unique to the Bible. And... Uh, I got my briefcase over there, uh, the most famous of the space-time theorems. But one of the authors of that, and by the way, if you want to read it, uh, 
got t- got I brought it here just so you can see the beauty of those tensor calculus equations. They're gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the authors of this space-time theorem, Alexander Vilenkin, he wrote a book a year and a half after uh, he and his colleagues published the space-time theorem. And he describes himself as an agnostic physicist. But this is what he wrote in the book. He said, quote, with the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And what is that problem? Proof of a space-time beginning implies a causal agent beyond space and time who creates our universe of space, time, matter, and energy. Or, to put it another way, a miracle-working God must exist. I mean, I run into scientists all the time. They say, I want proof of a miracle. I say, well, how about the biggest miracle you could ever hope for? A miracle of all matter, energy, space, and time coming into existence. And if God can do that miracle, he can do all kinds of other miracles. Well, my wife tells me whenever I give a message, I should really only give three points. I have this habit of giving about a 16-point lecture. She says, no, cut it down to three points. So these are the three points I'm going to give you. Crucially, what is the point of view for the account of the creation days in Genesis 1? What is the meaning of the Hebrew word day that's used in Genesis 1? And what is the description of the creation events and what is the chronological order and how can we put this to a rigorous scientific test? Well, step one, and one of the advantages I had, I had a Canadian public school education. They taught us the scientific method in grade one. We got it in grade two. We got it all 12 years. I didn't even pick up a Bible until I was in the 12th grade, but I was saturated in the scientific method. And so I recognized the scientific method when I opened up the Bible. Step one of the scientific method, do not interpret until you first establish the frame of reference or the point of view. Step two, don't interpret until you establish the initial conditions or the starting conditions. And what you see in Genesis 1-2, it explicitly states what the frame of reference is. The Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters of planet Earth. So it tells us we're to interpret the six days of creation from the perspective of an observer on the surface of the waters below the clouds. When I run into scientists who think that Genesis 1 is teaching scientific nonsense, I ask them, well, from what frame of reference are you interpreting the text? They say, well, God's frame. And what they mean by that is God sitting up there in the heavens looking down on the earth. I say, well, that's not what Genesis 1-2 says. It says the Spirit of God is hovering on the surface of the waters below the clouds, not above the clouds. If you put it above the clouds, indeed Genesis 1 is teaching virtually 100% scientific nonsense. But what I'll demonstrate for you, put the frame of reference on the surface of the waters and everything in Genesis 1 is described in scientifically correct language and the correct chronological order. And this is affirmed, by the way, Uh, Genesis 1 is not the only account of creation in the Bible. Uh, You go to Job 37, 38, and 39, it actually takes you through the content of the six days of creation, but in a lot more scientific detail than you get in Genesis 1. The same thing's true of Psalm 104, and to a lesser degree, Proverbs 8. And if you go to our reasons.org website, we list 28 lengthy accounts of creation. That's another thing that's unique to the Bible. It doesn't just give you one text on creation, it gives you over two dozen texts on creation. Because that's another principle of the scientific method. You want to test an experiment or an observation or a text by other observations, texts, and experiments. So what you see in Job 38, God speaks and says, I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness. Because Genesis 1-2 also gives you the starting conditions. It says, before God does anything on the earth, water covers the whole surface of the earth. It's dark on the surface of the waters. 
and the earth is empty of life and unfit for life. But then the Spirit of God begins to perform his miracles. And Job 38, verses 8 and 9 here, is explicit. It tells us the reason why it's dark. It's not dark because there's no light in the universe. It's dark because God had blanketed the seas with clouds that kept the seas dark. Now, if you remember nothing else from my talk tonight, please remember this. The frame of reference or the point of view for the six days of creation is on the surface of the waters below the cloud layers. Remember that, that'll help you whenever you run into a skeptic who thinks that Genesis is teaching scientific nonsense. Now concerning the meaning of the word day, are these days 24 hour periods or are they long periods of time? Just like the Hebrew language has no word for universe, it actually has quite a small vocabulary. The total vocabulary size of biblical Hebrew, if you don't count the names of cities and people, is only 3,000 words. English has a vocabulary size of over 4 million words. And so in English, we'll have maybe 6 or 8, sometimes even 12 different words that mean basically the same thing. I mean, uh, consider uh, when you run into someone uh, that is thin. We can call them slender. We can call them slim. We can call them thin. We can call them scrawny. I mean, there's all these different words uh, that mean the same thing, maybe with slightly different emotional connotations, but they all mean the same thing. You don't have that in biblical Hebrew. And frequently the nouns, especially the nouns, have multiple literal definitions. So the Hebrew word for earth, for example, has five distinct literal definitions. The Hebrew word for day has four distinct literal definitions. It can mean part of the daylight hours, all of the daylight hours, a 24-hour period, or a long but finite period of time. Now, I didn't have a Hebrew dictionary in front of me when I first picked up Genesis 1, but I immediately recognized that this word day at a minimum must have three distinct literal definitions because three are used in the text. So for example, when you go to creation day one, it's using the word day for the daylight hours. On creation day four, it's contrasting seasons, days, and years. That's day is 24 hours. But Genesis 2-4 uses the same word day to refer to the entirety of creation history. That's day is a long period of time. And when I read through Genesis 1 uh, for the first time, I noticed that the creation days uh, end with a statement, evening was, morning was, day three, four, five, whatever. And I wasn't sure what the Hebrew words for morning and evening meant, but I knew at a minimum it was telling me each of these days has a start time and an end time. I anticipated finding an evening and morning for the seventh day, but it's not there. There is no evening and morning for day seven. And as I read on in the Bible, I discovered that Psalm 95 and Hebrews 4 explicitly state we're still in God's seventh day. We're in the seventh day. So the seventh day is an ongoing period of time. And uh, that answered for me an enigma of science that had bothered me since I was 11 years old. I mean, part of my story was I got really interested in astronomy when I was seven. I was reading four or five books on physics and astronomy a week. And my parents, for some strange reason, thought I was being obsessive. And so when I was 11 years of age, they said, let's see if we can get Hughes studying something besides science and uh, or physics and astronomy. And they bought our family this big, thick book on evolutionary biology. I was the only one in the family that read it. <laughs> but I remember telling my parents, mom, dad, the numbers don't work. And they said, what do you mean? I says, well, we see all these phyla and classes and orders before humanity, but none of that after humanity. They said, go talk to your science teachers. They didn't have any answer. They told me to go talk to the professors I knew. They couldn't help me. But the first time I picked up a Bible, opened it up to the first page, I said, this answers the fossil record enigma. It explains why we see new phyla and classes and families and orders showing up before humanity. 
Those are the six days when God's creating and explains why we're not seeing it in the human era because that's the day when God rests from his work of creation. It also explains why so many astronomers believe in God because in astronomy, all of our data comes from the past. It takes time, after all, for these light from stars and galaxies to reach our telescope. So almost everything we astronomers study is from the six days of creation. But it explains why so few biologists believe. The vast majority of biologists do their research in the human era, and they say, we see no evidence for the supernatural handiwork of God. My response is, well, of course, you're looking on the wrong day. You're not going to see it in the human era. You will see it in the pre-human eras. So that was a huge uh, breakthrough for me the first time I picked up the Bible, how the Bible answers why we see new phyla and classes before humans, and we see none of that uh, after humanity. Now, if you want to read more about this days of creation issue, I've actually read an, uh, written an entire book on it called A Matter of Days. And once again, you can get a free chapter at reasons.org uh, slash Ross. But hey, I've already gotten through the first two points of my three-point lecture. We're already moving along. <laughs> but I'm going to take a little more time to get through point three. <clears throat> Does advancing science verify or refute the description in order of the Genesis 1 creation events. And you need to be careful how you read it. So in creation day one, it doesn't say that God created the light. It doesn't say that God made the light. That all happened in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created matter, energy, space, and time. So there was light pervading the universe. But as it tells us in Genesis 1.2, it was dark on the surface of the water. And what do you see in Genesis 1, 3 on creation day one? Let there be light. Let the light appear. So creation day one is when light penetrates to the surface of the waters of planet Earth for the first time. This is what allows photosynthetic microbes to begin to flourish over the Earth and to begin to chemically transform the planet so that plants and animals that later in the creation story can begin uh, to exist. And then we move into creation day two. And there's a lot of controversy in creation day two for the simple reason it's the shortest statement that you get on any of the creation days. Basically all it says on creation day two, let there be water above and water below. And so people have been debating, what is this water above? Is it referring to water in the galactic clouds above us in the atmosphere? Uh, what about this water below? Is it referring to the oceans? What's going on? Well, remember I said before, you get three accounts that basically go through the content of the six days of creation in a non-chronological order, but in a lot more scientific detail. And it's Job 37 and the first half of Job 38 that go into detail on what God did on creation day two. It basically describes the water cycle. Water above in the atmosphere, water below in the oceans and lakes, and how this circulates over and over again to ensure that we have just the right water cycle. And what you see in Job 37 and 38, it describes three different kinds of liquid precipitation, rain, mist, and dew, and three different kinds of frozen precipitation, snow, frost, and hail. And if you want humans to thrive on all the continental land masses, you need all six forms of precipitation. And notice how God designed the continents of the earth so that we get snow even at the equators. So for example, if you go to Ecuador, there's a mountain there in Ecuador that's got six glaciers on it. And so, and you know, that produces snow. Uh, and here in California, you can get frost uh, when the temperature is 10 degrees above freezing. I mean, that's how frost works. And so, and the advantage of having frozen precipitation, it melts very slowly. If all we had was the liquid precipitation, it would run into the oceans and the lakes and be unavailable. But the fact that we have these different kinds of frozen precipitation means our rivers and streams run 12 months of the year. And then we move into creation day three. 
and says, let dry ground appear. And so we see in Genesis 1, 2, our earth began as a water world where there was only water on the entire surface of the earth. But in creation day three, continents appear for the first time. Let there be these continents. Now, I was reading this many years ago uh, when, when you picked up the textbooks on geology, they were basically saying that continents have always been here. But I remember my late teenage years reading these textbooks and saying, well, they're saying that continents have always been here, but they're not providing any evidence. There's no description. This is just simply an assumption. And then I entered the University of British Columbia, and in my sophomore year, two of the three physicists of the world that launched the discipline of plate tectonics decided that they would teach the first course on plate tectonic theory. And I said, I gotta take that class. Well, it was filled with graduate students, but I managed to work my way into the class as an undergraduate. And I remember going and talking uh, to the professors. And you know, what they were presenting was, this was the old model of the continents. But they said, now that we understand plate tectonics, we realize that the continents were growing like this. Yeah, I'm dating myself. I took the course in the 1960s. And, uh, but I remember going up to those two professors and saying, I noticed you have the continents starting off covering about five to 7% of the Earth's surface. Would it work if it starts at zero? And they said, well, it could be anywhere from zero to 10%. We just don't have that kind of data to tell us. So that was my first, I wasn't yet a Christian, but that was a clue to me. Maybe Genesis got it right when it says it starts off as a water world. This is within the realm of this new theory of plate tectonics. Well, jump ahead to the year 2000. And now there's no doubt that indeed uh, the world begins with nothing but water on its surface, the model was you get a few volcanic islands and then you get these small continents. And when the Earth is a little bit less than half of its present age, you get this sudden jump in continental buildup. I said, that's interesting. Genesis puts it a little less than halfway through the story. And here we have the latest measurements of the growth of the continents and they put it at roughly the same time. Jump forward to the year 2018. And basically what they demonstrate is that you get these continents uh, exploding over the surface of the Earth at the same time that oxygen rises from one ten thousandth of a percent up to two or three percent. It's called the first great oxygenation event. But the paper basically made the point, this is really what the continental growth looks like. Uh, where for the first billion years, you got nothing but water on the surface of the Earth then you begin to get these small volcanic islands. Uh, but then at the first great oxygenation event, you get this sudden burst of continental growth. Almost all the growth happens within a narrow period of time. And then after that, you get a very, very slow growth of the continental land masses. And uh, you wanna read about this? I put out a weekly blog called Today's New Reason to Believe, and you can go on our website and look up the June 11th, 2018, or just put in creation day three into the search engine. That's all you need to do. The article will pop up and you can see how this was discovered. But what this is demonstrating is the principle you see in Job and Psalms, that the more we learn about nature, the more evidence we get for the supernatural handiwork of the creator and for the precise accuracy of what the Bible tells us about faith, practice, doctrine, science, history, and geography. And what this is basically demonstrating is that over the past 60 years, the more we've learned about the history of the continents, the tighter and tighter fit we get with what Genesis has been teaching for thousands of years. We're living in a time where we actually get to witness that. And then we go into the second part of creation day three, and it says, let the land produce vegetation. Now, I've debated the executive director of the Skeptic Society, Michael Shermer, on four different times on four different university campuses. The debate is usually whether or not God exists or uh, does the universe reveal God. It doesn't matter. Michael Shermer always goes off script 
and immediately goes after Genesis chapter 1. He's done that in every debate I had with him. We've never had an official debate on Genesis. It doesn't matter. Why? Because as an atheist, he sees that as the Achilles heel of the Christian faith. In every one of those debates, what he has said is, Hugh, your Bible got it dead wrong. Because it tells us that we get plants on the continents before we get animals in the ocean. And the fossil record tells us the exact opposite, that we get the animals in the oceans first and the plants on the continents later. And I remember the first time I debated him, I said, well, Michael, you have to recognize that animals have bones and shells. Therefore, they're going to be easily preserved in the fossil record. But plants are made up of soft tissues, and therefore they're going to decay easily. It's not surprising to me that we don't have the evidence of the early plants. However, I remember in the third debate I had with him, I said, well, you know, there's this paper that got published in Nature that says we haven't found the fossils, but we found the isotope signatures demonstrating that plants were present in the continental land masses for 200 million years before the first uh, animals show up in the oceans. And then in the last debate, I basically said, now we've actually found the fossils. A bit of an exaggeration. All we found were fossil parts. The biggest part we found was a millimeter in diameter. And again, that's what you'd expect. Plants decay relatively quickly. So the fact that the biggest one we have is a millimeter across is something we would expect. But it demonstrated that vegetation was abundant on the continental land masses for 600 million years before the first animals show up in the oceans. So another demonstration that the more we learn about nature, the more evidence we get that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant word of God in everything that it's got to communicate. Moving on to creation day four. It says, let there be lights in the sky. Verse 14. Again, important to note, it's not saying that God created the sun, moon, and stars or that he made the sun, moon, and stars. It says, let the great lights be and explains why. So that they may serve as signs to mark seasons, days, and years. And I remember long before I was a Christian saying, for whom? Well, if you go on to creation day five, that's when God creates the first animals. And I had enough biology under my belt during my late teen years to realize animals are different. They can't function unless they can actually see the position of the sun, moon, and stars in the sky. Every animal species needs to have that information in order to regulate their complex biological clocks. The microbes don't need it, the plants don't need it, but the animals need it. And so it's important that they be able to see the sun, moon, and stars in the sky. Now, we have a detailed measurement of the oxygenation of Earth's atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere began with way less than 1% oxygen in the atmosphere. And that little blip that you see there, that's the first great oxygenation event. But then the oxygen drops down below 1% and stays there for over a billion years. And then there's an event that you've probably heard about in your geology courses. It's called the Great Unconformity. Maybe I better ask, how many have ever heard of the Great Unconformity? Oh, gee, uh, not very many of you. Well, it's an event that happened about 578 million years ago where there was massive landslides being ripped off the continents and pouring into the oceans. It created the continental shelves. And these continental shelves provided the perfect environment for sea life because you've got relatively shallow water that's nutrient-rich. But that same great unconformity uh, caused a huge jump in the oxygen content in the atmosphere. The oxygen literally suddenly jumped from less than 1% up to 8%. Now, what happened back in 2018, a team of physicists decided to model this. So they got this huge flask. They filled it with the known composition of Earth's atmosphere, and then they moved the oxygen content from a tenth of a percent up to 8%. And what they discovered is, at a tenth of a percent, you can't see through the flask. It's just really hazy. You can see light through the flask, but you can't see anything through the flask. And so they gradually raised the oxygen content up. I'm going to give you kind of a simulation for that. 
And here's a simulation. I'm standing in front of a mountain that's about a quarter of a mile away. That's a famous mountain in Colorado, Engineer Peak. And uh, this is what it would look like from a quarter of a mile away if the oxygen content was less than 1%. I mean, it's just so hazy, you can't see the mountain. And then we raise the oxygen content up to about 3%, and you can barely make out that there's something in the background. It's still really hazy, but you can tell that there's something there. And then we gradually push the oxygen content up to 4%, up to 5%, get it up to 6%. And once it hits 8%, you see something you couldn't see in any of the previous images. There's the moon over there, okay? The moon wasn't visible in the previous ones, but once it hits 8%, you can see the sun, moon, and stars for the first time. And if you want, again, if you want to read about it, go to reasons.org, put Creation Day 4 into the search engine, the article will pop right up, and you can read it. In fact, I always give you links to the peer-reviewed papers, so if you actually want to read the original paper, you can do that uh, for yourself. But what's interesting is we look at the fossil record, the very instant that the oxygen content jumps up to 8%, you immediately have animals. There's no time delay. They show up right away. And all the different phyla of the Avalon explosion, they don't show up one phyla first and 10 million years later the next phyla, than the next phylum. And by, if you haven't had familiar with that term, phylum means a basic animal body plan. To give you an example, all of us human beings are part of the chordate phylum. That includes all animals with a backbone. It even includes animals that don't have a backbone. Any animal that has a long neural code, cord that runs up its body is part of the chordate phylum. That's the most advanced phylum. And so we're talking about a very broad classification. But at, at the Avalon explosion, 8%, uh, these animals, all the different phyla show up at once, but only the phyla that can survive at 8% oxygen level. These are animals as big as two meters across, so we got big animals, but these are animals that don't have a digestive tract. They don't have a circulation system. They don't have a brain, they don't have a heart. There's not enough oxygen su to support that. However, an event happens about 30 million years after the Avalon animals appear that drives them to extinction. And then the oxygen content, the same event that forced their extinction, generated another burst of oxygen where the oxygen suddenly jumps up to 10%. And at 10%, there's now enough oxygen for animals with brains and hearts and circulatory systems and digestive tracts ears and eyes. That's called the Cambrian explosion. And at the Cambrian explosion, all the different phyla show up at the same time at the beginning. The moment it hits 10% oxygen, suddenly all these phyla simultaneously show up. And brand new research, and I've got some articles that you can see in our website that I wrote just a few months ago, basically demonstrating on planet Earth today, there are 30 phyla. Well, guess what? All 30 of those phyla were fully present at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion. Yeah, they were all there at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion. Creation Day 5. Let the waters teem with living creatures. And this is what one of the world's foremost experts on the Cambrian Avalon explosion says. Uh, Gregory Ray says concerning the Cambrian explosion, the Cambrian explosion of body plans is perhaps the single most striking feature of the metazoan fossil record. Metazoan meaning big animals. The rapidity with which phyla and classes appeared during the early Paleozoic, coupled with much lower rates of appearance of higher taxes since, poses an outstanding problem for macroevolution. Basically saying we can't make macroevolution work. And then we have another review uh, by Kevin Peterson and his colleagues uh, where he writes some bioessays elucidating the materialistic basis for the Cameron explosion has become more elusive, not less, the more we know about the event itself. And in this book, Improbable Planet, I give you seven more quotes from leading 
uh, paleontologists. And here's what's really causing them uh, some concern. That is, the very latest research in the Cameron explosion tells us the phyllis show up before the classes, which show up before the orders, which show up before the families, which show up before the genera, and last of all, the species. Now, the heart of naturalistic evolution is that through natural selection, mutations, gene exchange, and uh, epigenetics, uh, you're going to get, if you wait long enough, a proliferation of new species. If you wait even longer, you eventually get new genera. If you wait even longer, uh, you get new families. And then you get new orders and new classes. And last of all, you get the phyla. But when we look at the fossil record, it's the opposite. The phyla show up first and the species show up last. It's the exact opposite of what you'd expect from a naturalistic perspective. Moreover, the phyla show up without any time delay. The moment the physics and chemistry permits the existence of these phyla, they're immediately there and they all show up simultaneously. Okay, moving into the second half of uh, creation day five. It talks about birds and it talks about sea mammals. But for the second time, uh, excuse me, here we go. Birds, let the birds fly, and then the sea mammals. But this is the only, this is just the second time you see the word create. You see the word create in Genesis 1.1, uh, where it says, in the beginning, God created the universe. The second time you see it is in creation day five, where it says, God created soulish animals. Animals that are not just physical, but physical and soulish. A reference to birds and mammals that not only have physical bodies, that are endowed with these soulish characteristics that manifest mind, will, and emotions. These are animals that God designed to serve and please a higher species and to relate to a higher species, namely we human beings. But what I find interesting, they were created before that higher species even existed. Long before God created human beings, he created these birds and mammals and endowed them with the qualities to be able to serve and please we human beings and to form relationships with us. Notice, we tame these animals. You want to know which animals are in that category? The animals that we can tame to do our bidding, to serve and please us. And then we move into creation day six. Now, creation day six does not talk about God creating the first land mammals. Creation day five, the first birds, the first sea mammals, but the text never addresses when God creates the first land mammals. What it does is it jumps ahead to three subcategories of land mammals, the ones that are addressed in the book of Job, the ones that God created to help us human beings launch and sustain civilization. And the first one it mentions are the short-legged land mammals. These are the rodents. And uh, you know, one of the things about rodents, they love hanging around human beings. You may have noticed that. Um, and because they have small body sizes, in order to maintain their body temperature, they grow thick, luxuriant fur. And we humans are wonderfully designed uh, for a warm climate. Notice amongst all the mammals on the face of the earth, we have the least amount of hair. And uh, we're tall and slender, and we're bipedal, which means not much sunlight falls upon us. And so we're able to stay cool when other animals cannot stay cool, and we have this amazing perspiration system. But one of the disadvantages we have, we don't do well in a cold climate, unless we're wearing clothing. And that's where the rodents came in. Uh, rodents love hanging around humans. They're cheap to feed. And uh, you can have thousands of them in a little pen. And early humans figured this out, uh, that they could you know, tame these animals and uh, feed them uh, for very little uh, expense. And then you could harvest uh, their fur to make clothing. And so it explains why, for example, the Neanderthals, which are wonderfully designed for a cold climate, were quickly outcompeted by humans. Neanderthals weren't wearing clothes. Humans were. 
And so very quickly, we were living in climate zones as much as 15 degrees colder than what the Neanderthals could uh, handle. Now today, we don't need rodents for clothing, but we do need them for medical advance. One of the most fascinating things I find about rodents is that their digestive tract is a very good analogy for the human digestive tract. You may have noticed they eat everything that we eat. That's because their digestive tract is so similar to ours. And what's really amazing is their brain chemistry, their brain is very different than ours, but the brain chemistry is virtually identical to the brain chemistry operating in the human brain. And medical researchers have figured this out that rodents make wonderful medical research animals because they're a terrific proxy for us human beings. And a lot of the medical advances that we share today are here thanks to the rodents. So thank God for the rodents. <laughs> but then we move on into the rest of Creation Day 6, and it talks about God creating the long-legged mammals that are easy to tame and the long-legged land mammals that are difficult to tame which I think is a reference to the herbivores. They're easy to tame. They make excellent farm animals, and uh, we can train them to do work for us, and they actually make a big contribution to our food supply. And then we've got these carnivores that are difficult to tame, but once they're tamed, they make excellent household companions. I mean, you really don't want to bring a cow into your living room. <laughs> You're not going to housebreak the cow and uh, you're going to be spending a lot of time cleaning up after the cow. But the wonderful thing about these carnivores, they can be housebroken. They can be trained to do our bidding, and unlike the herbivores, they really love to please us. They'll do anything to bring us pleasure. And I got a lion there. Uh, when I first arrived at Caltech, uh, there was this undergraduate student that brought his pet lion to class every day. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can Google it. You'll find it on, yeah, go, go ahead and Google it. Caltech Lion. You'll, it'll pop right up for you. Uh, <coughs> they don't let you do that at Caltech anymore. <laughs> but back then, uh, they were fine with that. What I remember was this lion would come into the classroom and immediately charge down to where the professor was <laughs> and then sit down beside the professor because the lion knew everybody was going to be looking at the professor. The lion wanted attention. So it sat beside the professor and uh, loved to engage everybody. Lions are incredibly social animals. So they make great pets, but they are expensive to feed. So, and um, with this particular lion, I remember the lion was happiest at lunchtime. Because what would they do at lunchtime? Release all the toddlers from the preschool. And they loved romping with the uh, lion, and the lion loved it. The lion would roll over on its back. I let all these kids, I mean, I also do remember though at about 7 p.m. it was time for the lion to go home. The student had this big van and he had this lion on the leash and he had the hardest time getting the lion to go home <laughs> because the lion wanted all that social engagement. Okay, you can read about these soulish animals in my book, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job. What I love about the book of Job is says God designed these animals to serve and please us not only physically and emotionally, but also spiritually. Because what you notice about these animals is they're trained to come to us and serve and please us. But when we abuse these animals, when we sin in front of them, they run away from us instead of towards us. Likewise, when we sin, we run away from God instead of towards him. As God designed the birds and mammals to serve a higher species, he designed us humans to serve a higher being. And what you notice with these animals is when we tame them, they outperform their wild cousins. Likewise, when we human beings allow ourselves to be tamed by a creator, we far outperform what we were able to do before we were tamed. That's just a few of the lessons that we learn uh, from these birds and mammals. I wrote a whole book on the spiritual lessons that we're taught. But last of all, God creates human beings. And this is the third and last time you see the word create. What's interesting about the birds and mammals is that God made them and he created them. What he made, manufactured, were their bodies. That was a miracle, but bodies existed before. What he created brand new was their soulish characteristics. 
Likewise, for us human beings, it uses two verbs to describe God bringing us into existence. It says God made us and he created us. Now the bodies and the soulish features weren't brand new. He made those. But what he created brand new was the spirit within us. And it's the spirit within us that allows us to relate to God, to discover God and relate to him. And notice we're the only species of life on the planet that even thinks about, is there a God? Or what is there in the universe? We're the only one even cares about the universe. I don't really see stars, uh, dogs and cats, meditating about the Milky Way. That's just not something they do. But we do. We're compulsively curious. And we alone have the capacity to form a relationship with God. We've read, written a whole book on this called Who is Adam? But this is what happened to me when I was 19 years of age. Having gone through all the creation texts in the Bible, I realized once you understand that the word for day uh, in the creation days refers to an epoch of time, God creating in six consecutive long periods of time, and the frame of reference for the six creation days is an observer on the surface of the earth. This is the score Genesis gets. It gets 10 for 10 on the description of the creation events. And it gets 10 for 10 in putting them in the right chronological order. And it gets 4 for 4 on describing the starting conditions of planet Earth. Now, long before I picked up the Bible, I went through the Hindu Vedas, the Quran, uh, the Buddhist commentaries, the Zoroastrian writings. The best I found outside of the Bible when it came to creation was the Enuma Elisha, the Babylonians. It got two out of 14 right. Say, how did all the other creation texts do? They all scored zero. But the Enuma Elisha got two out of 14 right. But the, only the Bible gets a perfect score on the initial conditions, the chronological sequence, and the description of the events. Once again, Hey, if you want that free book, just scan that code. Or if you're not fluent in smartphones, go to the ladies. They'll help you at the back. But again, something else I want you to remember as you walk away from here. The more we learn about science, the more evidence we gain for the inerrancy and inspiration of our book, the Bible, in all respects. As I mentioned, I'll take questions on any topic. Understand you've got a rule here. Those of you that are under the age of 20 get to ask your questions first. However, we got a rule even for those of you under 20. You can only ask one question per person and no fair giving me a six-part question. <laughs> so six-part question, you got to take six separate terms and I got one other rule. No softball questions. I only take hardball questions. Okay? And that goes for the rest of you too. No softball questions. Okay, who wants to go first? All right, thank you. <coughs> All right, any students want to go first? Got one okay, right here. Yes, of course. So you mentioned on the days of creation that you that um, God didn't create the stars or anything. Like, do you believe that He might have created them before? Or yeah, He created the sun, moon, and stars before creation day one. The light of the sun came through to the surface of the earth in creation day one, but creatures on the surface of the earth could not see these objects that God created in the sky until creation day four. Once again, the animals critically need to know the positions of the sun, moon, and stars in order to regulate their biological clocks. And that explains why it says, let there be light and let there be the great lights. Who's next? <laughs> okay. Uh, so I believe it was said that uh, uh, Adam was created from the dirt, earth, right? Yes. So would you consider that like a miracle or is there like, uh, is there also evidence to like back that up that like uh, we have a connection to whatever, to like whatever materials like are in the ground, like soil and stuff. I know we're both like carbon-based. Like, so. Well, there's everything in the dust of the ground uh, that makes up your human body. So all the ingredients are there. But it takes God performing a miracle to take those dust particles and make your body. I mean, a good example would be 
uh, you know, people going out and mining aluminum and iron and titanium and copper and uh, making a jet aircraft that you can fly on. Uh, it takes somebody with a mind uh, that knows uh, the physics and chemistry and biology to be able to take that raw material out of these iron and titanium mines and then manufacture airplanes out of it. Same principle with what's going on with God making the bodies of Adam and Eve from the dust of the earth. But it says he not only made them from the dust of the earth, he breathed into them the breath of life. And that particular sentence is referring to the spirit that God put within the human beings. And so he didn't just make their bodies. He made their bodies, their souls, and their spirit. And uh, what you see in Genesis 1, it uses the word create and the word make. The Hebrew words asa, make, and bara, create. What you see in Genesis 2, it uses the verb yatsar. That's another Hebrew verb that basically combines the concept of creating and manufacturing. So yeah, the Bible is literally teaching that all of humanity is descended from one man and one woman that God specially created sometime during the last ice age. Say, where do you get that from? Well, it tells us in Genesis 2 that when God put Adam in the Garden of Eden, four rivers came together in the garden the Pishon, the Gihon, the Tigris, and the Euphrates. And the text tells us where the four rivers flowed from. The Tigris and Euphrates from the region of Asher, which is Assyria, or modern day Iraq. And it tells us that the Gihon comes from the mountains of Cush, which is kind of at the southeastern corner, southwestern corner of the Arabian Peninsula. And then the uh, Pishon comes out of the mountains of Havala, uh, which is in western central Arabia. Now the Gihon and the Pishon are dry riverbeds today for good reason. The mountains of Cush and the mountains of Havilah no longer have ice on them. But the Tigris and the Euphrates uh, come out of the mountains of Ararat where there's still a large store of ice. So those are flowing today. But what I do in my book Navigating Genesis, I show you a satellite image where you can see the two dry riverbeds of the Gihon and the Pishon and the Tigris and Euphrates. And where do they come together? In the southeastern portion of what is now the Persian Gulf. Today, it's 200 feet below sea level. During the last ice age, it was about 80 feet above sea level. So sometime during the last ice age, God created Adam and Eve, and all of us humans are descended uh, from those two people. Now, how does that fit the science? The genetic studies where we take the genetic diversity of humanity and try to trace back, uh, those studies cannot give you an ancestral population. But it's roughly consistent with all of humanity coming from two people or a small population. And what's interesting over the last 60 years, that maximum ancestral population has gone from a million to 100,000 to 10,000 to 1,200 to 800. Today's at 32. I debated someone who's promoting the idea that we're here by common descent with a common ancestor with the Neanderthals and the chimpanzees. And uh, she was quoting uh, the 1200 and I says, well, I've heard 800, I've heard 32. Maybe we need to plot a graph. 1 million, 100,000, 10,000. It seems to be heading towards the biblical too. Wow. That's really cool. All right, uh, kids, any more questions? All right, uh, Dr. Ross, you said that uh, humans are obviously different than animals. Yes. And different from Neanderthals. Uh, humans are tall and hairless, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm short and hairy, so. But and you're not as hairy as a chimpanzee, okay? okay? Right. There's a difference. So, so I'm not Neanderthal. You're not a Neanderthal, okay. no. But despite what my wife says. Well, Neanderthals <laughs> had short arms and short legs relative to their body height. And <laughs> you may not be as tall as I am, but I can tell your arms are long relative okay. to your body height, and your legs are especially long. We're the only bipedal primate species that has ever existed that's had such a long leg length relative to our body height. And that explains why we're able to run, uh, walk, and sit and, uh, you know, because that's one of the amazing things of humans. 
We can sit in front of a computer for 12 hours a day. We can walk for 12 hours a day. We can run for 12 hours a day, and our back doesn't give it on us. That's amazing, isn't it? It is amazing. We're wow. the only animal that can do that. So next time somebody calls me a knuckle dragger, I, I don't have to believe them. It's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, your wife might call you a Neanderthal. I mean, I always tell my wife, look, I'm an astronomer. All my data comes from the past. I cannot be held responsible for what happens in the present. All right. But I don't get away with it. I don't imagine you get away with much no, either. not much these <laughs> days. All right, big kids. Uh, you've got to have some questions. All right. Oh, my wife does. She got the hand up first. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Ross. Um, okay, I have a question that is going to sound really dumb, but okay. So if we can trace all of humanity, and maybe you covered this, and I was out running around doing stuff, but so so. Adam and Eve, right? Mm -hmm. And their kids. But where did the rest, like, you know, I don't, how do I say this delicately? Where did no. the rest of the humans come from? Okay, what you notice in the book of Genesis, there's no prohibition against brothers marrying sisters. After all, Abraham was married to his half-sister. When you get to the book of Exodus, it's now prohibited for brothers to marry sisters. Now, uh, what we know from animal husbandry, if you're wanting to make a new breed of a dog or a cat or a goat, uh, you can take a brother and mate it with a sister. You can do that for about 20 consecutive generations without running the risk of propagating a genetic defect. But once you get past 20 generations, the risk is not trivial. And so, for example, what we see in uh, Egypt is they believe that uh, the pharaoh was God. And as God, he can only marry a God, so he married a sister. And so after many generations, uh, the pharaohs had hemophilia. And so genetic defects began to creep in. Uh, so that explains why there's a prohibition in Exodus, but no prohibition in Genesis. The other thing we need to consider is when God created Eve, I mean, all women, when they're born, have their reproductive eggs intact. They're all there at the moment of birth. So when God created Eve, she had her full set of reproductive eggs, and I think God made them all genetically distinct, which means that you could have a much longer period of time in which brothers and sisters and first cousins could uh, marry one another because if Eve began with all these genetically distinct eggs, uh, you're gonna have significant genetic diversity. So for example, when you look at the genetic uh, differences in the population today, they are consistent with all of us coming from one man and one woman, even if Eve did not have genetically diverse eggs. <clears throat> but I think God did give her genetically diverse eggs. It would just enhance the health of the human population and basically help humans when there were times of natural disasters which would cause a population uh, collapse. I'm already familiar with your answer, but for the, for the sake of the students, could you explain to them what caused the reduction in um, life expectancy and age that you see in <coughs> Genesis with the long lifespans, and then we get a reduction of that? Well, you know, I did say that you can get a free chapter of Navigating Genesis by going to reasons.org slash Ross. That's the chapter we're giving away. That chapter explains how we went from a lifespan with a maximum of 969 years down to a lifespan of no more than about 120 years. And what I do in that chapter is basically explain how that would have happened and why God shortened our lifespan. In terms of how, uh, there are two astronomers, a Russian and an English astronomer, that have been partnering for decades. And what they've discovered is, over the last 100,000 years, there was a supernova eruption that's responsible for more than 95%
have a fast-moving, heavy nuclei cosmic rays. Now, we're all exposed to cosmic rays, but the vast majority of those cosmic rays are electrons and protons. And yeah, after a thousand years, they're going to do some significant damage. But if you're only going to live to be 120, you really don't need to worry about those cosmic rays. Although they do say if you live in Denver, your lifespan is shortened by three months because of cosmic ray exposure. But what these two astronomers discovered is the cosmic rays that do really significant damage are oxygen nuclei, helium nuclei, iron nuclei, uranium nuclei moving at high velocities. It's because of those uh, cosmic rays no one can li make it past 120 years. Uh, no matter how healthy you live, the cosmic rays will get you. Although some have speculated, well, what if we had humans living underground in a salt mine? Uh, that would be nice because the salt would basically protect you from the uranium and thorium in Earth's crust, so you wouldn't be exposed to radiometric elements. And if it's deep enough down, you wouldn't be exposed to cosmic rays. But they did some experiments on humans, basically putting them in a contained capsule that was seven acres, and they discovered they uh, didn't last more than six months before they went insane. So uh, we humans actually need to have a fair amount of uh, spatial geography to maintain our sanity. And hey, if all you're looking at is salt all day long, I think you're not even going to make it those six months. <laughs> so. I'm sorry to disappoint you, 120 years is it. On the other hand, what I've written about in um, Why the Universe is the Way It Is, is that when people live to be eight or 900 years, the population very quickly evolved towards almost everybody was evil, for good reasons. If you've got a serial killer living to be 900 years of age, they can kill off a lot of people. And who are they gonna kill? They're not gonna kill other serial killers, uh, they're going to be killing the righteous that have their guard down. And so very quickly the human population uh, became quite wicked except for one family. And after the flood was over, God says, we got to come up with a shorter lifespan. And so with a maximum lifespan of 120 years, people like Adolf Hitler and Joe Stalin don't live long. And because they don't live long, millions of people are surviving. I mean, Adolf Hitler was told by his doctors in 1944, you're gonna die soon of Parkinson's. And so he made some very irrational decisions in the last year of his life that probably shortened the course of World War II by a full year. And also Adolf Hitler, when he realized he was going to defeat, he concocted a plan to exterminate 80 million Germans. He was never able to pull it off. He killed a lot in the last uh, month of his life but he wasn't able to fulfill that plan. So the fact that we don't live as long as the antediluvians lived is actually a good thing. And after all, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, where you're going after death is way better than what you're experiencing right now. So it's to our advantage that we not live long. <coughs> How would you address individuals that, uh, and Christian organizations that are actually using what they're saying, scientific methods to say that we are only 6,000 years old, that a day, there are literally six creation days, 24-hour days. How do you address that? Well, that's interesting. I never even knew these people existed until I came to California. <laughs> <coughs> Maybe there's something about our state that attracts them. I don't know. Uh, <coughs> but um, no, I became a Christian at age 19. I didn't meet a young earth creationist until I showed up at Caltech at age 27. So, uh, you know, here I went eight years. And uh, when I first met them, I said, where did you get that from? And they said, well, we just looked at Genesis 1. These are clearly 24-hour days. And I said, I don't know how you got that out of the text. And that just made them even angrier. Uh, but what I've learned with young earth creationists, they're not going to listen to the science. They don't trust the book of nature. They have this doctrine that we humans are fallen and because we're in a fallen state, we can't interpret the record of nature. I mean, I share with them, well, if that's the case, we can't interpret the book of scripture either. And indeed, our fallen nature 
causes us to misinterpret the book of scripture. But basically what I share with people that are Christians is when you run to these people, forget the science, go with the Bible, and realize the Bible is 66 books, not one book. Not all the answers are in Genesis. There's 65 other books. Look at all the creation texts. And I've debated many young earth creationists. You can watch a lot of the debates on YouTube. And uh, you know, basically I make the point, if you insist on taking the creation text literally and consistently, it's impossible to read the Bible as a young earth book. It's clearly an old earth book. The problem I have with young earth creationism, it means that different books of the Bible contradict one another. But I would use that for issues like divorce and remarriage, uh, finances, I mean, whatever. Before you adopt a doctrine, read all 66 books and insist that they be read consistently. One book can't contradict another. It's all the word of God and it's impossible for God uh, to lie or deceive. But I'll give you a quick one. Seven places in the Bible it tells us the laws of physics don't change. Every young earth creationist model critically depends on altering the laws of physics at the fall of Adam and the flood of Noah by at least a factor of a million times. The Bible explicitly tells us that did not happen. Jeremiah 33, God says to the Jews, you change your mind all the time, but I'm immutable. I'm a God that never changes. As proof, look to the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. And you can read the rate study. It's a two volume set put up by young earth creationist scientists. I counted six times in that book where it says, if the laws of physics don't change, the earth and the universe must be billions of years old. So they themselves uh, concede that point. Uh, if the laws of physics don't change, uh, that indeed uh, the earth and the universe are billions of years old. Now, I could give you abundant science that proves that the laws of physics don't change. But the crucial point is the Bible tells us it doesn't change. Um, the other side of the argument, uh, our friends at BioLogos, uh, have they ran the genetic numbers back to historical Adam, or are they just, do they even want to go there? Oh, they do. And uh, <coughs> we've also been debating the folks at BioLogos. In fact, we wound up doing a, a, a debate book with them, where the team that you saw here basically wrote articles, they wrote articles, and the articles were adjudicated by Southern Baptist theologians. It's an interesting book. You, you can see it on our website. And what I like about the book, because you know, I've known Francis Collins for more than a decade, and you know, we recognize that we hold very different views on science and the Bible. Uh, but Francis and I said the Christian community needs to see two organizations that strongly disagree with one another, but disagree in a spirit of charity towards one another. So the book has a very charitable tone, but we're explicit where we agree and where we disagree. So I, I think you need to say that again. <laughs> Pretty please. <laughs> well, let me put it in a biblical context. Second Corinthians 5, it says we're ambassadors for Christ and we're to call non-Christians to make their peace with God. But how can they make their peace with God if we're at war with one another? I mean, Jesus said, they'll know you're my followers by your love for one another. So hey, when you run into Christians that disagree with you, make sure you disagree in a spirit of charity. As it says, always be prepared to give good reasons for your faith and hope in Christ, but with gentleness and respect. And that's something we put right on our website four core values that we expect all of our employees to publicly manifest. Gentleness, respect, humility, and courage. Those are the four core values. But we're arguing we need that. And, and by the way, what I find fascinating when I read church history, for 2,000 years, Christians have been uh, fighting one another in very non-Christian ways over the non-essentials of the Christian faith. You see that in Acts 15, where you had the Jews and the Gentiles fighting over the doctrine of circumcision. And 
you know, the Jerusalem Council settled it, but they were still fighting one another and killing one another for another 30 years. And uh, if you read church history, Christians have always fought over the non-essentials. The age of the earth has got nothing to do with salvation, but people are fighting over the age of the earth. And when I told my young earth friends, a time will come when this will no longer be a controversy or an issue of division. And when that happens, God will replace the age of the earth controversy with another church splitting controversy that has nothing to do with salvation. <laughs> now, I've actually got a theological reason for why God does that. It's a way he can train Christians, basically to get them back to 2 Corinthians 5, as they realize, hey, you know, this way we're treating one another is harming our outreach. And also the thing I've noticed in reading church history, whenever the church divides over a non-essential, it's targeting an unwelcome people group. And what Paul said is the mystery of the gospel is God taking two groups of people or three or four groups of people that are enemies and making them friends. And so he took the Jews and the Gentiles and made them one people. What I see going on in Israel today is that Jews are being converted to Christianity. Muslims are being converted to Christianity and they're fellowshipping in the same church. Two people greatly divided, they're being brought together. And so I think this is why God allows these church splitting controversies to come in, is basically to demonstrate the mystery of the gospel. So good. You're, you're going to be preaching on my church Sunday. <laughs> All right, Joyce. Two questions about uh, the, t the time, what, how many billions of years would, do you think between day, creation day one and creation day five? And then concerning the creation of Adam, you mentioned the ice age, but since I don't know when that is, can you be <laughs> more specific as to how many years ago you think Adam was created? Right, well, concerning the creation days, people keep asking me, Hugh, can you give us a chart with dates for when day one begins and when it ends? I've been reluctant to do that because the error bars are not trivial. There's significant uncertainties as to when creation day one ends and creation day two starts. But roughly I can share this with you. As you go from creation day one to creation day six, the days are consecutive. Uh, but the time duration gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So creation day one has the longest duration, creation day six has the shortest duration, and I'm really praying that creation day seven is even shorter than creation day six. I mean, creation day seven will end when the full number of humans that God intends to redeem have in fact been redeemed. So yeah, I'm praying that that day be really short. <laughs> so. And in terms of your uh, second question, the date for the last ice age is 14,000 to 120,000 years ago. Uh, but what we see in the archeological evidence, the earliest archeological remains we have for human expression show up in East Africa and the Persian Gulf. And there's three times during the last ice age when there was an easy, migration route between the Persian Gulf and Eastern Africa. After all, during the last ice age, there was a land bridge joining Arabia to Africa. And we actually can see how East African rats migrated into the Persian Gulf. So those are three dates that we have. I think it's like 117,000 years ago, uh, 71 or 72,000 years ago, and about 50,000 years ago. So I think one of those dates is most likely but if you want to pin me down, I would say we've got carbon-14 that tells us that humans have been around at least for the past 40,000 years. And we know the last ice age ended 120,000 years. So there you go, 40 to 120,000 years with those three dates I gave you as being probably the sweet spot. What I find really interesting, that biblical date is more accurate than our best scientific date. Now often you'll read the scientific literature and they say humans have been around for 300,000 years. But if you read the scientific research papers, the date is 150,000 plus or minus 150,000 years ago. 
So the scientific uncertainty is quite broad, uh, but the biblical date, although not as accurate as what we would like, is a lot better than our best scientific date. And people ask me, are we ever going to get accurate scientific dates? I don't think so. Because once you get to the limit of carbon-14, up until you get to 250,000 years ago, from 40,000 to 250,000, we don't have a single radiometric dating tool. All we have uh, are highly indirect dating methods. And some of those methods have uh, systematic errors of plus or minus 2,000%. Now, I've got an article on this on the website. So if you go to reasons.org and put in human origins dates, you'll see an article that comes up where I talk about how you get a biblical date and what's the best we can do with the scientific dates. Great. <coughs> little confused about um, the terms for creation. You said that the word creation was used. Only yeah, the word create is used three new. times in Genesis 1 and 2. So what was happening when other things? Well, I, yeah. God performs miracles in three different ways. <coughs> there are miracles that are completely beyond the laws of physics. So when God created the universe, he was creating the physics. He was creating space and time. When Jesus walked on water, that was outside the laws of physics. But the vast majority of miracles we see described in the Old Testament and New Testament are what I would call transformation miracles. Equivalent to taking the dust of the earth and making a human body. It's not going to happen by a tornado coming through a dust field. It's going to take someone with a mind, with great power and intelligence and knowledge uh, to be able to take that dust of the earth and manufacture the bodies of Adam and Eve. And then there's uh, the sustaining miracles, which you see in Colossians uh, chapter uh, uh, 1, basically making the point that it takes the continual operation of the creator of the universe, the second person of the Trinity, to sustain the physics and the chemistry so that all the molecules remain intact. You know, you've got passages in the Bible where it says, if God were to withdraw his presence, we would all breathe our last breath. If God were to withdraw his presence, all the molecules and atoms would disintegrate. So God is actually miraculously sustaining uh, the record, uh, the realm of nature. And when the full number of humans has been redeemed that God intends to redeem, the universe will have fulfilled its purpose. God's going to wrap it all up. It'll disappear. And it's going to be replaced by a brand new creation. But in the new creation, you're still going to have God performing transformational miracles, transcendent miracles, beyond whatever physics he creates, and the sustaining miracles. And do you see any room in that transforming for anything that looks like evolution? Well, we do see microevolution going on in real time. So, for example, uh, you'll see a bird species, and some of the birds will fly over a high mountain range. They reproduce on the other side, and when they meet the birds on the other side, they refuse to mate with them. Well, biologists call that a speciation event. Keep in mind that biology is a much more of a fuzzy science than physics is. And so in the biological literature, you'll see 16 different definitions of a speciation event. You know, in my opinion, if you can reverse what happens with that bird, you haven't really created a new species. In other words, take the birds on one side of the mountain, bring them into contact with the birds on the other, wait a few generations and see if they'll mate again. I mean, we've done that experiment with buffaloes. We used to think that the uh, wood buffaloes were a distinct species from the plain buffaloes. What we discovered is when you bring them into contact with one another, uh, they really are a single species. Yes, the wood buffaloes are bigger, but hey, they're living in a really cold climate. So that's going to cause microevolution to make the body sizes bigger. How do you buy brown bears and polar bears being? Well, like Did brown... They Okay, the Alaskan brown bear and the grizzly bear are really one and the same species. 
but black bears are distinct and polar bears are distinct. So, and uh, when you read the Bible, it uses the word men to describe different categories of life. And it's not exactly the same way biologists have classified uh, life. So for example, it uses the word men to describe six different species of owls. So there the word men has a rather narrow definition, but it uses the same word men to describe four different categories of flying insects. And there it's using the word men as we would define a genus, where for the owls it's using the word men to describe a species. So the biblical treatment is a little different. And the Bible is saying creatures reproduce after their own kind. So it's basically making the point you're going to see way less microevolution for birds and mammals than you will for insects, which is exactly what we observe uh, when we do field experiments. I mean, ants and termites, uh, we do see them evolving. After all, there's a quadrillion of each of them. So, I mean, you've got a large population and they have a short generation time. The shorter the generation time, the larger the population, the greater the probability that mutations and natural selection are going to produce a distinct breed uh, or a, a species that's closely related to the one. Uh, but for example, when you look at mammals, there were 8,000 mammals on the face of the earth when God created Adam and Eve. Today, there's only 4,000 left. And of those 4,000, not one of them is new. We have yet to see the appearance of a new mammal species in the world of nature. And yet we've seen half of them go extinct. Anybody else? Uh, when you use the word, or when it's in there, human beings, I am assuming it's not generic, it's for homo sapiens, or maybe it's generic, but if that's the question, since Denisians and Neanderthals coexisted with homo sapiens, were they all created under that at the time the human beings were created? Well, uh, I wrote an article on our website, it's a fairly new one, where I talk about the population levels of the uh, Denisovans, the Neanderthals, Homo erectus, the Australopithecines, and we got the best data for the Neanderthals. But it's basically stating uh, from 250,000 years ago uh, to 50,000 years ago, their population never got above 15,000 and most likely never got above 8,000. And so with population levels that low, they're not going to evolve. And that's verified by the fact that when we look at the skeletal remains of Neanderthals that have been dead for a quarter of a million years and compare them with Neanderthals that have been dead for 45,000 years, they're the same. We see no evidence of any change. And we see the same thing for all the other bipedal primates. The other thing we notice too is that we don't see a linear evolution of brain size. If you look at these bipedal, and they, they extend over the past six and a half million years, their brain size does this. In fact, the most recent bipedal primate that's not human has a brain size four times smaller than ours. And so we don't see a linear progression in brain size. Neither do we see a linear progression in bipedal capability. The bipedal capability likewise goes up and down like this. And what you see in the scientific literature, every time we discover a new bipedal primate species, it puts the evolutionary model in greater chaos, not lesser chaos. But there is one thing where we do see a linear progression. The ability of these bipedal primates to hunt large-bodied bird and mammal creatures. And so that's where you see a linear progression. And it was Ian Tattersall He's a well-known, he's a famous atheist anthropologist, and he was at a meeting with Fuzz Rana. Fuzz spoke here a little while ago. And uh, it was Ian that basically told Fuzz, what I'm seeing uh, with these bipedal primates doesn't help my model, but I think it really helps your model. Because in your model, you've got humans uh, that are in rebellion against God and they're abusing their environment. 
And what we noticed, what he pointed out is, notice Australia had no bipedal primates that preceded humans. When humans came into Australia, they quickly drove to extinction 94% of all the bird mammal species in Australia. When humans came into Africa, they drove only 4% to extinction. And he says, his uh, hypothesis for why there was such a high survival rate in Africa and such a low survival rate in Australia. It says in Africa, of the 11 known bipedal primate species that preceded hu humans, 10 of them uh, were present in Africa. And the extinction rate was only 4%. In Australia, zero. So his idea is that, uh, he says, I think this better fits your model. If God separately creates all these bipedal primate species, this would basically train the large body bird mammal creatures. When you see tall bipedal mammals with weapons in their hands, run away. Because right. <laughs> keep in mind, what you see in the book of Job, God designed these animals to come to us and serve and please us. And so these animals were in danger of being driven to extinction. That happened in Australia. It also happened in North America and South America. North America, South America, and Australia all had horses and camels and easy to domesticate cows. When humans went into those three continents, they wiped them all out. And hence, the humans in North America, South America, and Australia never got out of the Stone Age. Whereas Europe, Asia, and Africa, we see uh, technology advancing. And it did in Australia too, but it only happened when the Europeans brought them the animals that they had killed off. That is, I've read in a scientific book that I think it's 3% uh, of human DNA is the same as from the Neanderthal, is that correct? Correct. Well, it's what, what, what they're really saying is that we see that similarity with Europeans and to a lesser degree Asians we're not seeing it at all with the sub-Saharan African population. And the argument is, well, the sub-Saharan African population would have had no contact with Neanderthals, whereas the Asians and Urims would. And therefore they say that explains why we see a little more DNA similarity in the Europeans and the Asians than we do with the sub-Saharan Africans. However, what we notice is that DNA similarity that Europeans and Asians have to a slightly greater degree, none of that DNA affects behavior or anatomy. And so the anatomical and behavioral differences we see between Europeans and Neanderthals is identical uh, to the distinctions we see between Sub-Saharan Africans and Neanderthals. So I do agree that there is evidence that some limited interbreeding occurred, and it does show up in the genome of certain uh, human populations, but evidently it had zero impact on the anatomy and zero impact on the behavior. And particularly look at the DNA of Neanderthals that governs brain structure and uh, brain operation, radically different than anything you see <coughs> in any of the human populations. So, what's the explanation for Neanderthals? Like, they're, they're separate from Adam and Eve, right? So they're not, are they related to them or like? No, what I'm saying is that Adam and Eve is the ancestor of all humans. Neanderthals are not human. The Denisovans are not human. None of these bipedal primates that preceded uh, humans are human. And in fact, we've written extensively on this. You'll see that reasons.org is also in our book, Who is Adam? is that there have been papers published making the claim that Neanderthals uh, were sophisticated and were capable of technology. But what we're documenting is that we can't discover anything about the Neanderthals that we don't also see being manifested in chimpanzees. So for example, there are papers published saying 
these Neanderthals had to be fully human because they had control over fire. Well, the problem with that uh, claim is that we only see evidence for Neanderthals taking advantage of fire in the summertime. We have zero evidence for winter. If they really had control over fire, you'd expect to see a lot more evidence in winter than summer. And so in our model, what they're doing is the same thing that chimpanzees are doing. The summertime is when you get wildfires. And when a wildfire breaks out in Africa, the chimpanzees gather up all these nuts that they can't crack open with their stone tools. And they throw these nuts on the wildfire, they run away from the wildfire, they come back when the wildfire is over, they gather up all their nuts, and now they can easily break them open. And in terms of the tools that Neanderthals are using, all of their tools are single-shaped stones, just like what we see with the chimpanzees. You don't see bows and arrows. Uh, you don't see shovels where you got a piece of wood, a sinew, and then some kind of shaped rock. Uh, and what we also see with humans, they're actually harvesting these stainless steel asteroids, meteorites, and turning them into sophisticated stainless steel tools. We see none of that in the bipedal primates. So everything that the Neanderthals do, we can actually see chimpanzees doing the same thing. Okay, but then... So, I get Neanderthals are separate from humans, but then what is the explanation for them be like ever even existing? Because Well, my whole point is Ian Tattersall's argument. He says, God would know ahead of time that we human beings were going to sin. And because of our sin, we're going to be abusing these animals instead of caring for them. And, you know, these large-bodied bird and mammal species, it's a really easy food source. So, for example, we saw when humans came into North America, they quickly wiped out the mastodons. The mastodons are easy to kill, and you kill one mastodon, uh, you can feed a village of 4,000 for two weeks. So, I mean, it's an easy way to live. Uh, and that's what was going on in Australia, North America, and South America. Whereas in Asia, Europe, and Africa, these animals, having been exposed to these bipedal primate creatures, realize, hey, if they got weapons in their hands, run away. Well, there is claims for Neanderthal art and Neanderthal symbolism. In fact, we just responded to one paper that was published claiming that Neanderthals had an alphabet. But if you actually look at the cave, what you see are six vertical lines running down the cave. I mean, trying to claim that that meant that they had an alphabet is quite a stretch, in my opinion. Matter of fact, I'm wondering if those six vertical scratches uh, were drawn by a bear, because we know that bears shared the same caves uh, with these Neanderthals. So we recognize that these claims are being made, but we also say, hey, when you look at the scientific literature, don't just look at one paper. So you got this paper claiming that Neanderthals had heart expression, but you'll find dozens of papers that dispute the claim. So it's not undisputed. And so that's our whole point. Do not give credence to a claim in the scientific literature if it's disputed uh, by the colleagues, uh, you know, the fellow scientists working in the discipline. I mean, if nobody's disputing the claim and everybody's saying, hey, this is, this is credible, then I think you can look at it and say, yeah, that really is credible. But if it's being disputed, and that's the thing, all these claims that Neanderthals are human, every one of those claims is highly disputed. I mean, I debated, uh, you know, young earth creationists, for example, have a doctrine that they believe Neanderthals and Homo erectus are fully human. And a debate I had just two weeks ago, they're saying, well, they found this cave with stalactites in it, and they're all in a jumble. They said the Neanderthals there must have been building a home structure with a fireplace and all that. Well, all you got is a pile of broken stalactites. And uh, you know, maybe it's the remains of a collapsed uh, dwelling, uh, but there's no way you can prove that. Uh, you okay, the art in the caves of the Spain are done by humans. So, I mean, the dates on that, the oldest date you got for cave art is 32,000 years ago. But, you know, we got evidence for humans baking bread that goes back 34,000 years ago. 
humans using these stainless steel asteroids. So it's like uh, that's well within uh, the range. And by the way, the art is complex. You not only see them putting animal uh, things on the cave wall, you actually see them uh, telling a fictional story. Uh, so this is something that only humans manifest. We're the only ones that engage in something like um, uh, the Tolkien thing, Lord of the Rings, you know, fantasy literature. Uh, there's no evidence that the Neanderthals were engaged in fantasy literature. And by the way, I think we need to be cautious about that. I'm now writing a book where basically I'm saying this claim uh, that the ancient Israelites believed in a flat earth with a dome over it, where the stars were attached to the inside of the dome with water above it, that's confusing fantasy literature with science literature. Yes, that is in the ancient Near Eastern literature, but it's exclusively in their fantasy literature. And I basically document that the ancient Near Eastern peoples were well aware of the Archimedes principle. There's a limit to how high up you can get water. So the idea that they believed that there was thousands of miles of water in liquid form above the dome over the earth, they knew enough about gravity to realize that's utterly impossible. But it is in their fantasy literature. So, uh, I mean, just imagine, uh, you know, archaeologists 1,500 years from now going through the old film canisters of uh, the Disney uh, uh, people and saying, well, you know, these people actually believe that mice could uh, talk just like people could. So. <laughs> all right, everybody, it is time. I think we could go all night, but let's give Dr. Ross a hand. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. I feel enlightened. I'm sure he'll take a couple more questions, but get your kids home. It's late, and uh, we would love to have him back. God bless you guys. Have a good night. Hope this is helpful. If you would like to support RTB, there is a donation box in the back. Drop some money in there. That would help. You can also go to reasonstobelieve.org. They have a donation button there, too. Thank you guys so much. God bless.